But I've learned that actually all of us have got stuff inside that we often keep locked away. And the more we open up, the more we share, the more we reveal those parts to other people and to ourselves, I think the happier, the healthier we can be, the people around us can be. I truly believe that everybody has the ability to be the architect of their own health and happiness. Magnesium Breakthrough is my favorite magnesium supplement. Click the link in the description to save 10%. Rangin, one of the many things I love about the new book is that the focus on happiness isn't something that is fixed. You talk about it, and this is actually the one point you want people to take away at the end of your book, the fact that happiness is a skill, something that we can take on almost like going to the gym and build on it, which is just so optimistic for people if they feel like they're not in a good spot when it comes to happiness right now. Yeah, I mean, I think every human being wants to be happy. I really do believe that. And happiness, I think it gets misinterpreted a lot. I think you could say the term happiness to 10 different people, and they're going to come up with 10 different ideas of what that means. So I've been very clear to define what I mean by happiness. I have this concept called core happiness. And I designed it literally to be simple, but to be practical so that happiness ends up being something that we can work on. It's a skill that we can develop and practice. You know, we we understand, don't we, that if we go to the weights, it, sorry, if we go to the gym and we do bicep curls every day, we're going to get stronger biceps. We're going to become stronger and healthier. We know that, right? But with happiness, I don't think it's quite as clear cut. And I think it can be as clear cut once we break it down as to what it is. So that's why I created this core happiness model it's to help everyone, no matter where they are in their life, whether they are, you know, feeling pretty stressed out and close to burnout, or whether they actually feel, you know what, life's okay. It's not bad, but could I be getting something more out of life than I'm currently getting? For me, with this, what I try and do with all my work is I want to make things practical and usable for as many people as possible. And I firmly believe that happiness is a skill that anyone can practice once they know what to work on. Well, let's get deeper into your model. You mentioned it there, and it's three legs of a stool. So I'll have you take that and explain in further detail what that is. Yeah, so think of core happiness as this three-legged stool, right? Each of the legs is separate, but essential, right? So if any one of these legs starts to weaken or collapse, your feelings of happiness will also start to weaken and ultimately collapse. And I work really hard to try and create a model that I think holds true in every situation. And it, it took me a long time to come up with this three-legged like stool, if I'm honest. It was, I was trying all kinds of different things, and I was trying to come up with a complete model that works for every person in every situation. And I haven't found a situation yet where this doesn't hold true, but you know, I welcome hearing that. You know, I'm not attached to it necessarily being right. I just feel it's very, very helpful. And I keep testing it. So what are these three legs, right? Alignment, contentment, and control. So alignment, leg number one. Alignment is when the person who you really are inside and the person who you are being out there in the world are one and the same. That's alignment. When your inner values and your external actions start to match up. Contentment is about those things that you can do in life that give you that feeling of calm, peace, you know, as I say, contentment, what are those things? And the third leg is control. Now, I thought Jesse long and hard about the word control, because I think control can also be misinterpreted very much like happiness. But I think it's the best word for what I'm trying to get across. And I, I tried it on many of my friends, many of my patients, many of the public, and people sent, seem to get it straight away. When I say control, I'm not talking about controlling the world, right? I'm not talking about controlling external events. I think the last few years have, have shown us very much that actually the world is going to do what the world is going to do, right? Whether we want things to be a certain way or not. When I say control, I'm talking about a sense of control. What are the simple things that you can do in your life that give you a sense of control? Because we know from the research that people who have a sense of control over their lives, they have higher levels of motivation, they have higher levels of academic success, they have higher social maturity, um, they 
They are healthier. They are happier people. And conversely, people who don't feel a sense of control over their lives have really high levels of psychological stress. So these are the three legs of the stool. The new book basically has a lot of simple practices that don't cost any money at all that people can practice to work on their alignment, to work on their contentment, to work on their control. And the side effects of working on those three legs is that you are going to feel happier more often. So you're not actually directly working on happiness, you're working on those legs. And, you know, another way for people to think about it is, is like happiness, instead of being this thing, this, this almost mirage that one day you'll stumble across when the world around you is a certain way, uh, when people around you treat you a certain way, you know, that that's never going to happen, right? That's not you know, that, that that doesn't give us a sense of agency that we can, you know, move towards that happier version of ourselves. And happiness in many ways can be thought of as a direction that you decide you're going to take in your life. And, you know, I passionately believe that these tools are going to help everyone. Uh, they have helped me in my own life, you know, at the point where I'm talking to you now, Jesse, I'm 44 years old. I've never felt this good. Like, when I say good, I mean, this deep sense of inner peace and contentment that is relatively immune to what's going on outside of me. You know, not completely, but I don't need the world around me to be a certain way now for me to feel good. I don't need people around me to act in a certain way all the time in order for me to feel good. This core happiness model has helped transform my life. It's helped transform the lives of many of my patients. And I I really hope with this book, it's going to help transform the lives of many more people around the world. So for somebody listening now, they have the model. We're going to get into the tools. How can they go about assessing? You got into this a little bit there, talking about now that you're in a state of of being happy and, and feeling good, you're in a position where relatively outside factors can't affect you as much. So I'm just trying to get to the essence of this happiness. Is that kind of when somebody knows that they've the work they've been doing is paying off and they feel like they have that resiliency from from inside? Yeah. Um you do the work, right? You keep working on these things. Uh sometimes you can't feel a tangible improvement day to day, but then you notice like things just happen in life and you think, "Oh man, a few years ago, that would have really stressed me out. Like I would have created this narrative on my head. I would have, uh, I would have made a big deal out of this. Oh, what happened this time? And I, it just sort of sailed over me. I didn't react. I didn't get triggered. Um, so you see this stuff playing out in real life. Sometimes I've had many examples in the past few weeks where it's like, oh man, you really have changed. Like you really have learned how to not let these uh, external events affect how you feel inside, right? One of them, um, oh yeah, I don't know how relatable this is or not, but this is this is literally happened about three weeks ago. So as we're recording this, Jesse, the, uh, my book came out maybe a month ago in the UK and I'd be doing lots of promotion. I'm currently on my tour. And I remember like I, I had a slot to go on this, this program called BBC One Morning Live, which is one of the big uh, mainstream TV channels to, to talk about the book. And I was, you know, really excited to have the opportunity to go on and talk and share the message. And the taxi was meant to pick me up from the studio at 6.30 in the morning, right? So um, it arrived at 5.30 in the morning and I wasn't quite ready. So I, I went out to the driver. I said, hey, listen, um, you know, I can see you here early. He said, no, no, this is the time. I said, oh, okay, cool. Um, look, the time I've got is 6.30. He goes, no, no, the time is 5.30. You know, are you, you, I need to take you now. I said, hey, listen, look, if if you, you know, if you can't wait, that's cool. No problem. You know, I'll get another taxi. I was really quite calm in that situation where I would have been quite triggered, I think, a few years ago because I was going to be on live TV and the driver's, you know, saying this and I was totally calm. And he goes, no, no, I'll wait. I said, okay, cool. Thanks. So I went in, I got showered, I got shaved, I got ready, came outside at 6.25, can't see the taxi anywhere. Taxi's gone, basically. I phoned up the company and said, yeah, the taxi driver's left. He didn't want to wait. Now, I know a few years ago, Jesse, in that situation, I would have created this emotional response in my body. It would have been, 
oh man, I can't believe this. Typically, this would happen today, wouldn't it? I'm on live television. I need to be there in an hour and a half. The show goes live. The taxi's not here. You know, all this kind of disempowering narrative in my head, right? In that moment, Jesse, I promise this is what happened. I was like, okay, cool. Driver's not here. Well, I'll phone a few local companies. There'll either be someone ready or not. If there is, great. If not, we'll find another solution. I phoned it, I think, two companies. The second one said he will send a cab around now. Problem solved, right? But the point I'm trying to make is, and I guess this seems a bit disconnected maybe to core happiness, but it really isn't. It's about how we approach the world, how we think about the world, how we deal with stress. You know, many of us think happiness is going to arrive when uh, the stresses and obstacles disappear in our life. Right. Well, that ain't ever going to happen. You know, that is part of life. There's always going to be struggles. And it was a really beautiful example for me because I can think that I feel happier and more content. But then you get these real world scenarios where, you know, stuff happens and you go, oh, wow, I would have reacted differently in the past. I felt totally chilled and relaxed. I didn't feel any emotional tension. And I think, Jesse, there's a wider point there for me, which is, why would a doctor, a medical doctor like me, write a book on happiness? You know, I don't think that's normal, right? Why, you know, what, you know, I've been a medical doctor now for almost 21 years. I don't think many doctors write books on happiness. I, I don't think it's usual. And the reason I decided to write this book is I've always been fascinated, Jesse, by what is the root cause of why this patient is in front of me? What's really going on? Why have they presented today? why have they got these symptoms? And for many years, I've said that 80 to 90% of what we see as doctors is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles, right? I'm not putting blame on people. I do understand that modern life is tricky. Many people find it very difficult to make the choices that they really do want to make, which is why, you know, podcasts like yours or mine, I think hopefully are really helpful for people because it helps provide some sort of inspiration and some sort of actionable information that they can use to improve their lives, right? But I started to think, well, is lifestyle the ultimate upstream cause? Or is there something that's even more important than lifestyle? Because I would see some patients who would make lifestyle changes for a few weeks, a few months, they'd feel better, they'd feel more energy, they're sleeping better. And then they'd revert back to where they were before. I mean, this is very, very common. Or I would also see some patients who had a lot of kind of seemingly unrelated symptoms. They would change their lifestyle, diet, movement, sleep, everything looks really, really good. Yet they were still struggling. And I thought, well, wrong. And what are you missing here? Is there something you're not looking at here? And so I, I reflected on my 20-year career and I thought, well, which patients truly transformed their lives? Which ones really made the change for good? Um, and I looked into the research and now I'm convinced, Jesse, there is something that's even more important than our lifestyle to think about. And that's happiness. That's our mental well-being. You know, how we think about the world, how we approach the world, because often what goes on up there, how you deal with stress, for example, if you take a disempowering narrative, you create stress in your body. And then the downstream consequence of that is that you make all kinds of poor lifestyle choices on the back of that. And so the research shows very clearly that happier people are healthier, right? Yet, you know, you've interviewed many medical doctors on your show. Um, you talk about health a lot. I don't think that the conversation around health includes happiness enough. And I think it needs to because happier people are healthier. Now, why is that, right? So I think that's really interesting. Why are happier people healthier? I think for me, there's kind of two broad things to look at. Number one, right, is happier people naturally make better lifestyle choices, right? So if you're someone who feels pretty happy with life, pretty content with your work and, and the state of your life, you know, you're less likely to dive headfirst into a tub of Ben and Jerry's in the evening, right? You're less likely to be counting down the minutes till 5pm so you can have two or three beers or half a bottle of wine just to unwind. So I think we naturally get that. People who are happier naturally make better lifestyle choices. But it's not just that, Jesse, because 
even if you look in the research, even when we account for lifestyle, happier people are still healthier. And there was this beautiful study, which I think demonstrates this so well with nuns, right? They followed these nuns across their life. And what was amazing about these nuns is that their lifestyle was the same, right? The same diet, the same sleep, the same movement, no difference there. But they found very clearly that the happier nuns significantly were healthier and they live longer irrespective of lifestyle. So I, th I find that incredible. Another study which really helps back this up is uh, more recently, the scientists took uh, two groups of people into the lab, right? And, and, and essentially, they, they injected all of them with rhinovirus. So what's rhinovirus? Well, it's the bug that causes the common cold, right? And what's really interesting is that not everyone got sick. And they could tell who was going to get sick or when they looked at who got sick, they could split them into two categories, right? The not so positive mood category got sick three times more often than the happier group, right? So this is really profound, right? We're, we're all being exposed to multiple bugs every day, like rhinovirus, and your mental well-being, your happiness can hugely influence whether you're going to get sick or not. So there's all kinds of things in the research which are showing us that happier people are healthier. And I thought, well, if I want to empower people to take control of their health, to live happier, healthier lifestyles, yes, I've written about lifestyle in my first four books, and I still stand by everything that's in those books. Lifestyle is important, but we also need to take into account happiness. And as I've mentioned, as you mentioned, Jesse, I firmly believe happiness is a trainable skill that anybody can learn once they know what to work on. Um, if I just finish up also, Jesse, what you said, you said, well, how can somebody tell where they're at in their life? You know, if they're happy, if they need to do a bit more work? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do that. One thing I'd ask people to think about is the opposite of core happiness, which is junk happiness, right? So. We've all got a junk happiness habit of choice. In fact, I would say most of us probably have uh, more than one junk happiness habit of choice, right? So what is a junk happiness habit? It could be sugar, alcohol, gambling, three hours on Instagram, online shopping, uh, online pornography, which is a huge problem these days, like all kinds of things. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with having a junk happiness habit. The problem is, is when we engage in these junk happiness habits too often, or we make the mistake that these junk happiness habits are truly making us happy when they're not, right? They're simply there to distract us. They're there, the, the, the things that we turn to when we want to avoid feeling how we're feeling or we're feeling uncomfortable and we want to distract. And this is why, Jesse, honestly, I think a lot of public health guidelines fail and they don't land with people. They're just too dry. For example, you know, if the government say you shouldn't drink more than 14 units of alcohol a week, for example, right? It's just very dry. I'm not sure what that really means to people. It doesn't really connect with people. I understand that there needs to be a guideline, right? So I, I get that. But in my experience, all behaviors serve a role, right? They're all there for a reason. So, you know, this is this is one of the reasons why a lot of people can give up alcohol in January for two weeks, for three weeks, for four weeks, no problem. But usually for most people, they creep back. And before you know it, they're, they're right back to where they started because the alcohol was playing a role in their life. If their job was really stressful or they're in a difficult relationship, right? The alcohol was being used to help numb that stress. So yeah, sure, try and stop it in January. But unless you remove the stress or find another way of coping with it, you're always going to go back to that behavior. So I'm very passionate about helping people understand that you will have some junk happiness habits. Maybe you've got some that you've tried to cut down on in the past. And the problem is, is that if you've been struggling and you keep trying a different diet or a different regime or something different, well, maybe there's a missing piece there. Maybe there's an underlying emotion. There's an underlying condition in your life that you're not dealing with. Because why, if you keep reverting back it's because there's something still to be unexplored. And again, there's a lot of concepts like this in the book where I help people understand, oh, this is why 
I keep engaging in these junk happiness habits. And it comes back to that core happiness tool. If you are not living in alignment, if you're not feeling content, if you don't have a sense of control over your life, right, you are going to engage in more of these junk happiness habits. You know, the truth is, Jesse, when I was in my 20s, I used to gamble a lot. I, I used to love gambling, right? Never to the point where you would say, um, you know, Rongan's got a problem. He needs to go and see someone. But if I reflect back, yeah, I was probably gambling more than than would be healthy. I'd gamble on the football, on the, the golf, at the casino, at the bookmakers, whatever. I can see now that actually... I was using that because I didn't feel so good in myself. I needed that quick hit. It made me feel something. But I haven't gambled in over 10 years, Jesse, and I've not tried to stop. That's the interest in me. I'm not trying to stop. I no longer have that hole in my heart anymore that I need the gambling to fill. Uh, it's basically since my dad died nine years ago, and I've started to go inwards. Uh, rather than looking outside for answers, I've turned the ship around and started to look inside for answers. And I've kind of healed all this kind of, you know, crazy stuff that was going on inside me. I don't need those behaviors anymore. So I have less junk happiness habits in my life now than ever before because I've changed things. I've changed things internally so I no longer need them. So did, th did that make sense, Jesse, that last bit? I kind of tried to, try to get yeah. through it quickly. No, there was a lot there. That was great. But I do want to actually riff off of what you said there at the end because I'm sure a lot of people can relate and they have these junk happiness habits that, you know, maybe just listening to us right now, they're able to pinpoint them and they're ready to start, you know, using them less or using them only periodically in a healthier way. Because like you said, they're not something that you have to totally avoid. It's just you don't want to be abusing them. In your case, the gambling, it sounds like when you did the deep work which we, we're going to get into, how to build up that core happiness in a healthy way and get into the tools. But as somebody is, is doing that work and they have these junk happiness habits that they're trying to pull away from, is there any strategies you have to help fill those voids? Because in your case, it sounds like you didn't need it, but I'm sure a lot of people, if they are relying on sugar or it could be anything, you named a bunch of different things, what would you say to somebody so it's not just ripping the Band-Aid or is going cold turkey best? So I think there's many different things that people can do. One thing that I found to be really helpful is this practice um, that helps people be more aware. So I want to say here, before I get into what that practice is, is that being aware of when you are starting to engage in junk happiness habits is huge. It doesn't mean you can change it straight away. But without an awareness, you will never make that long-term change, right? And so this exercise really helps you build that awareness, right? I call it the three Fs or the freedom exercise. So let's say that someone listening or watching to this right now is, uh, they have a problem with, let's say, ice cream in the evening, okay? So um, they, they don't want to have the ice cream. They're trying to lose weight. They're trying to be healthy. But somehow they end up on the sofa at 9 p.m., and there they are with the tub, scooping it out from, from the tub. Okay, this is pretty common. Okay, so the first F out of these three Fs is feel, right? So what I want people to do is just take a pause. You've got the ice cream before you have it, or any sugar, whatever it might be. Ask yourself, what are you really feeling? Are you physically hungry or emotionally hungry? And all you need to do is just pause for a minute like two minutes, just ask yourself, you know, what's going on here? Am I, am I really hungry in my stomach? Or is there something else going on? You know, have I, have I been on Zoom calls all day and I'm just feeling a bit yucky and this is just my kind of um, treat for myself? Have I had a row with my partner and this is just to make me feel better? Um, has the kid's bedtime taken longer than usual and I just want to sit down and, and numb that? Whatever it might be for you, that's okay. Go ahead and eat it afterwards, right? No problem. But that you're just starting to build an awareness of what's really going on. The second F is uh, feed, right? F-E-E-D. So now that you know what you're feeling, let's say stress, how does food feed that feeling? Ah, okay. Oh, I feel stressed. I have ice cream. I feel better temporarily. I feel less stressed. Okay, cool. Now you're starting to understand why you're engaging in that behavior. Fantastic. Go ahead and have it. No problem. Then next time, 
you go to the third F, right? So you've done what the feeling is. You've identified how food feeds that feeling. And now the third F is find. Can you find a non-food behavior to feed that feeling? So for example, let's say you've been on Zooms all day or you're feeling really, really stressed and you, you just want a bit of time to yourself. Well, instead of going to the sugar, maybe you could run yourself a bath and nourish yourself with a bit of self-care. Um, maybe you're feeling a bit yucky because you've not been out for a walk yet or anything. Maybe you could have a 10 minute workout. Uh, maybe you could do a five or 10 minute yoga flow on YouTube, for example, just to deal with that emotion in a slightly different way. Um, you know, maybe you're feeling a bit lonely and you're, you know, trying to get that connection with the ice cream tub. Maybe you could phone up one of your best friends or your parents and have a chat. I know this sounds simple. This is so, so effective, Jesse. So many people are unconsciously living, they think I can't stop eating sugar, but they've never ever taken a moment to figure out what role is the sugar playing in their life. So, you know, we've done that via food and with sugar, but you can use that for anything. You can use that for alcohol consumption. You can use that for gambling. You can use that same exercise. If you can't resist scrolling Instagram for three hours every evening, go through the same process. What is that doing for you? Because awareness is the first step in any long-term change. So I think that's an incredibly useful exercise for many people to just, you know, help develop that self-awareness. Yeah, very simple, but powerful. And now I want to come at it from the other angle. So now we've talked about it from a junk happiness. We realize there's a problem there and we want to work at it from trying to deter ourselves from going down that junk happiness pathway. But let's talk about it now from core happiness and how somebody can go about beginning to use different tools that you have in your book. I want to talk about some of them here to build up that core happiness like we're putting on our armor and giving ourselves that resilience day in, day out to feel happy. Yeah. Well, look, when you start working on this core happiness tool, you will find that your baseline level of contentment and happiness starts to move up and you will naturally be less inclined to engage in junk happiness habits. And that's the power of it. It happens almost without planning it, without trying to, like it happened with me with some of my junk happiness habits. They just, I just don't need them anymore. Like I don't have that discomfort that I need to kind of numb myself away from. So yeah, you know, let's take alignment, for example, one of the legs. Um, you know, we'll never get through all the tools. There are so many in the book, but let's let's take alignment. I think one of the biggest problems, Jesse, in society, when it comes to health, but also happiness, which of course are linked, is that we confuse success with happiness. We think they're the same things. And for most people, they're, they're just not. They can overlap if we're intentional about our life. But for many people, it's simply, it doesn't play out like that. And I mean, this is certainly what happened, you know, with my own dad, for example, I saw this firsthand. My dad was an immigrant from India to the UK in the 1960s. He worked incredibly hard to give himself, his family, you know, us, his family back home, a better life. But my dad killed himself working, like literally killed himself working. He had success, but he wasn't happy. Um, you know, he, my dad would literally work four nights a week as well as his day job as a as a medical doctor. So for 30 years, my dad only slept three nights a week. Four nights a week, he was out on a car doing house calls around Manchester and then in his day job in the hospital. Just, I can't even imagine it now how you can only sleep three nights a week for 30 years, which is why at the age of 57, 58, he suddenly comes down with the autoimmune disease lupus um, his kidneys fail and he's chained to a dialysis machine for 15 years until my until he dies just over nine years ago. So I saw firsthand that you can confuse success with happiness. Now, I want to say, I understand that dad had to make choices, right? He was in a different country, right? I'm not blaming him for what he did. You know, I, I love my parents. I think they brought me and my brother up really well. But I saw firsthand how too much work chasing the wrong things can make us sick. And we certainly don't feel happy. And although that seems like quite an extreme case, Jesse, 
I see this sort of thing playing out all the time with my patients. We talk about chronic stress now and burnout a lot, right? I'm sure you've covered it on your show before. And we talk about practical things people can do. And I talk about this a lot as well, you know, breath work, journaling, moving your body. What are these things you can do to help reduce that? And I'm all for those things. But sometimes I think, well, why don't we go further upstream? Like, why are so many of us working so hard, pushing ourselves to do more than we can bear? Because we've been seduced by this idea of what success really is. We confuse ourselves that more money, a better promotion, a nicer car, a nicer hotel on holiday, these things are going to make us happier. And time and time again, we see that people, when they get those things, they, they don't feel happy right? There's still a hole inside of them. And so, you know, I've spoken to a load of people on my podcast who say the same things. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the chap Johnny Wilkinson before, Jesse, or not. No, um, not specifically. He's super famous in the world of rugby. Um, you know, he's one of the most famous rugby players. And in 2003, in the final minute of the World Cup final, Johnny Wilkinson kicked the winning goal to give England the World Cup right? He's on the, the back pages all over the world. What's really interesting is that Johnny Wilkinson, when he came on my show a few weeks ago, he said, you know, even before the ball had gone through uh, the goal, he started to go down. And the following morning, he woke up feeling nothing, empty, lonely, feeling depressed, anxious. He'd reached all his goals, right? In fact, when he was seven years old, he wrote down on paper, I want to play for England. I want to win the World Cup. The problem is, at the age of 24, he he's basically achieved his dreams and he feels worthless because, you know, when he was a kid, he played rugby because for the, he enjoyed it for the love of the game. And then somewhere the shift started to be, he played rugby because he thought it would say something about who he was. It would make him somebody. And that change in relationship is what led to the change in how he felt about it and why he's really, really struggled since then, right? So you see this play out over and over again, right? People reach these high levels of success, but they're still literally crumbling on the inside. So what can people do, right? What can people do? One of the exercises in the book is a two-part exercise, right, which I really, really love. So um, if I, Jesse, I could try it on you now, if, sure. you, if you're interested, give it yeah, a go. Let's do okay. It. If I was to ask you, what are three things that you feel you could do each week that would give you a real sense of happiness and contentment? What are three things that you might say? Number one would be spending quality, uninterrupted time with with my family. Yeah. Which could include things like taking weekends off or having dinners together. I would say another one would be to make sure I'm getting enough sleep. So making sure I'm prioritizing that just so my energy during the day is good for those interactions with family and for work and everything. And I would say to do work that I really think is is impactful and, and meaningful, which I've been lucky enough to pivot into doing this show and having these conversations that go across the world and people get to tune in and, and upgrade their, their health and well-being. So I would say those three off the top of my head, I'm sure I could come up with eight more, but. Yeah, but it's, it's a very similar thing. You just, you know, what's coming up for you, which, so I love that. Okay. So the second part of the exercise is, it's called write your happy ending. So now imagine you're on your deathbeds and look back on your life. What are three things you will want to have done? Spend as much time with family and friends, primarily family as I can. So it comes back to the first, first point I made before. That to me is above all, like head and yeah. shoulders above the rest. So that, that one. To, I guess this relates again to what I said, because the second one would be to, you know, look back at, what I've created in the world right now, the focus is on the show, but it could pivot. You know, I'm still young. I have a lot of time and a lot of energy to create things and help people. But uh, to look back and realize that the work I had done was meaningful and it was helpful to people. And then I would say the third one is just that I took care of myself. And this, I guess, can relate to the sleep piece, but I'm doing it in a more, 
uh, zoomed out fashion where take good care of myself so I'm feeling energized and feeling happy and feeling present just so I can make the most of all those interactions with people and and the work I'm doing. I I love it, Jesse. I mean, what beautiful answers. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that those two things are aligned because you, you know, you speak to all kinds of incredible people each week on your show. And, you know, through that, you're going to be learning and experiencing stuff all the time, and you're going to be making better and better choices. One of the you know, great advantages that you have and I have of hosting these podcasts, we get to speak to incredible people and we get to improve our lives as well in the process, right? But what's so good about that exercise is that it helps people bring real intention to their life. For example, some people will say, on my deathbed, I want to have spent time with my friends and family. And they look at their weekly life and go, I don't have time in my week to have that happiness habit of actually spending time with my kids or seeing my buddies or whatever it might be. And and this is not an exercise to be used as a stick to beat yourself up with. No, it's about being compassionate and going, oh man, you know, I know at the end of my life, I'm going to want to have nourished my close relationships, but I don't have time. Okay, what can I do? Okay, I'm going to make a new thing now. Okay. Um, You know, for me, for example, mine are very, very similar to yours, actually, Jesse, very similar. And I have this thing that I that is written on my fridge. Um, one of my weekly happiness habits is can I have five undistracted meals with my wife and kids where I'm not thinking about work, where I'm truly present for that interaction? I don't always manage it, but it's but generally I do because I've defined it, I've written it there, and I've made it measurable. It's a number. I know if I do those five undistracted meals each week with my family. Well, I'm pretty sure at the end of my life, I'm going to I'm gonna get one of those things that I want in my happy ending, which is I nourish those deep and meaningful relationships. So it's a very powerful exercise. And here's the funny thing. You know, I said my answers are quite similar to yours, Jesse. Well, we kind of all think we're quite different, don't we? And we've all got different preferences and, you know, we've all got different desires in life. Well, sure, we do. But we're not as different as we might think, right? We know with a high degree of certainty what you, what me, what everyone listening is going to say on their deathbed. How do we know that? Because palliative care nurses tell us over and over again. People say the same thing. I wish I'd worked less. I wish I'd spent more time with my friends and family. I wish I'd allowed myself to be happy. And and the one that really deeply resonates with me every time I say it and think about it is, I wish I'd lived my life and not the life that other people expected of me, right? We know what we're going to say, but many of us are living a life that means we are not going to get that happy ending. My dad did not get his happy ending. My dad had all kinds of plans for retirement. He was going to set up a street clinic in Calcutta in India. He was going to travel the world with my mum. Nothing. He couldn't fly. He couldn't travel. He was chained to a dialysis machine three times a week for 15 years. And many of us are doing our own version of that. So I'd encourage everyone right now to pause, right? Or think and do that exercise. Don't just imagine it. Do it. Write it down. Because you may not be able to change things immediately. You may not be able to suddenly overhaul things. And you don't need to. Even that little shift, like I mentioned, five meals with my wife and kids each week, even that is bringing more intention to your life. And as you do that, you are working on the alignment leg of the core happiness store. You're going to strengthen that and you will find naturally you engage in less of these junk happiness habits because you focus on the right things that really nourish you. Jesse, I had a patient a few years ago, okay, 37-year-old chap who really demonstrates this as well. I mentioned my dad's confusing success with happiness. This chap, Stuart, from the outside, it looked as though he was crushing life, okay? He ran his own business. He drove a sports car. He was working when he wanted to from his laptop on his own terms, right? No one's going to tell him when to work. He's working when he wants to. On the weekends, working all the time. He comes in to see me in my clinic and he says, Dr. Chassie, look, um, I, I think I might have depression. I said, okay, what's going on? He said, well, Some days I wake up, I feel really low. Some days I can't motivate myself to get out of bed. Some days I'm just lying there thinking. I feel indifferent 
about things. I can't get pleasure in what I'm doing anymore. Is this depression? And I spoke to him. I ran some tests. I got to know him a bit. I asked him a question. I said, hey, what do you do? Do you ever like hang out with your friends at all? He goes, Doc, you know, I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm running a business. You know, I, I kind of see what they're up to. I see their photos on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and that's the funny thing, Jesse, isn't it, about the way we live these days is that we can see what our friends are doing. We can see what food they're eating. We can see where they're going on holiday, but we don't actually have to see them. So what I said to him, I said, hey, listen, what I want you to do until the next appointment with me in six weeks, I want you to see one of your friends in person every week. And when you're with them, I want you to put your phone away. Now, you know, it probably wasn't the prescription he was expecting from me, right? But he was desperate. He said, okay, right, I'll give that a go. Six weeks later, he comes back in. He's almost bouncing through the door coming in to see me. I said, hey, Stuart, how are you doing? He goes, doc, I feel like a different person. Uh, I've got my mojo back. I've got my lust for life back. Yeah, things feel great. I said, what happened? He said, well, on a Sunday morning, I'd go to the local cafe, meet up with one of my friends, and we'd just catch up for an hour or so. And after a few weeks, we decided to set up a game of five-a-side football after work on Wednesday, and we'd get the guys together and play. I said, is that it? He goes, yeah, that's all I've done. Right? This guy completely transformed in six weeks by doing those two small things. Now, I saw him for a few months afterwards, and you know, I talk about a ripple effect quite a lot. One key change can lead to so many other changes. So because he hadn't played five-a-side football or five-a-side soccer in years, right? He was unfit. He couldn't keep up. So he decided to go to bed a bit earlier. He would start to eat a bit better. He wouldn't stay up till midnight binge watching box sets on Netflix, right? So he was just getting better and better. So he didn't have to give up his job. He didn't have to not run his own business, right? It's not either success or spend time with your friends and family. No, it's like, how can we just make sure we're focusing on the right thing? So Stuart did not have an antidepressant deficiency in his life, right? He had a friendship deficiency. And when he corrected that friendship connection deficiency, and I appreciate not everyone is as lucky as Stuart in terms of living nearby to their friends. He actually happened to live very nearby, so he could meet them face to face. And I think that really illustrates what I'm trying to I get across, right? Many of us are falling into this trap of chasing things that we think are going to make us happy. And I'm saying, just slow down, take a pause, take a big 30,000 foot view at your life, do a few of these simple exercises and figure out, are you living a life that is really nourishing you? And if you're not, right, maybe it's time to just reflect and start to make a few simple changes that over time will really start to build up. And what I love about this example of getting together with friends and getting active, and this is a general theme I found from reading your new book, is that it doesn't cost anything. So, and again, I want to highlight the fact that there are so many tools, we're not going to get into all of them, obviously, today during a conversation. But if somebody is worried about finances holding them back from becoming happy, the good news is there are so many things we can do that are free or basically free. Jesse, everything in the book is free, actually. I, I was really something that, you know, I've worked in lots of different uh, areas during my career. I've worked in some very deprived areas. Uh, I have, uh, you know, one practice in particular I worked in, there was high levels of poverty, a lot of people on benefits, uh, a lot of people really, really struggling. And I've used these tools and principles in this book and my previous books for years, whether it's with wealthy patients or with poor patients, because I'm very passionate that I want to give out health information that is, is accessible to as many people as possible. And certainly in this new book, Happy Mind, Happy Life, nothing costs any money. It just requires a bit of time. It just requires you to make a decision and say, hey, you know what? I want my life to be a little bit different than it currently is. Um, you know what? I think I could be getting something more out of life. I, I feel I'm chasing the wrong things. Let me do some of these. Let me start bringing a bit more intention to my life. And I know this stuff works, Jesse, because not only do I feel fantastic these days, like really, you know, I say that, you know, I don't feel even ashamed saying that the old me would feel bad. Or if I'm saying that, I'm going to make people feel bad. No, 
if if someone feels bad when I say that, um, that's really not a reflection on me. You know, I'm I'm sitting here telling the truth, saying I actually do feel this deep level of calmness and contentment these days. And I've been very, very open in this book. I've shared a lot of struggles I've had in my life, a lot of insecurities I've had to overcome. And I'm also, you know, what's different with me, Jesse, now compared to a few years ago is that I'm not trying to convince people anymore, right? Uh, maybe I'm a bit older, a bit more mature now, a bit more experienced, but I'm not here to try and convince people that this is the way that they should live or these are the tools that they need to do. Everyone's free to choose how they want to live their life. What I'm trying to do is share information in a non-judgmental way, in a compassionate way and say, hey, look, you know what? If you feel there's something missing in your life, if you feel a bit lost, if you feel as though you're struggling a bit, as if life isn't going the way that you wanted it to go, I'm trying to say to people, it's not as hard as you think to make a change. There are lots of really simple things that will make a massive difference once you start paying attention to them. And on the other end of the spectrum, coming back to the things in the book being free, do you find a lot of times those are the things that are harder to get your patients to do and to stick to? Because, you know, I find this for myself and and just working with other people that when somebody has to put money down and say, go buy the latest superfood or buy this gadget that can yeah. track their fitness or whatever it might be, I don't know if it's the fact that there is skin in the game or whatnot, but it can make those changes easier to stick with. So I'd love yeah. for you to talk about that. It's a great point, Jesse. You know, I, I think there's something, there's, there's so much truth into what you've said. Sometimes people have got to invest enough of themselves into something for it to feel worthwhile. I remember, you know, um, for, 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 I remember, you know, I've worked in the National Health Service. I, I don't anymore. I worked in the National Health Service for almost 20 years. And um, I remember when I started to see private patients as well, I noticed that it was often the, the National Health Service for people who are not aware is 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 the kind of government health service here in the UK where no one has to actually pay for when they're getting treatment. It's paid through via your taxes, but you're not actually paying anytime you go and see the doctor. What I found is in private practice is it was often the the patients who it was probably a struggle to afford, or it, you know, it really meant a lot to them to pay the money to come and see you privately. I found that those patients stuck to everything they did what you asked them to do whereas a lot of the wealthier patients it was almost just as you say Jesse as if there wasn't enough if it did if it, they hadn't put enough in that actually they felt it it was like yeah I'm not going to follow that advice it's too hard I'm not going to do it you know so I think there's definitely some truth to that um but I think there's other ways around that so a lot of these exercises for example you know you could get your partner to do it as well and keep yourself keep both of yourselves accountable or your best friend could do it or a work colleague say, why don't you do that? I'll do it. And then we'll just keep checking in with each other week on week to keep each other accountable. So I think there's definitely some truth to that, but I also don't think it means that we can't do the free stuff. I think if we give it the importance in our own minds and we create a structure on how we're going to do these things, I, I, I really think it can make you know a massive, massive difference. Um, like for example, right? One of the things I, I have a very uh, specific morning routine that I do every day. And I'm a better human being when I do this morning routine. I'm a better a father, I'm a better husband, I'm a better doctor. So I have structured my life in a way that, you know, I go to bed most nights by 9 p.m. I'm in bed or asleep and I wake up at five. <clears throat> and I wake up at five. That is typically what I do. Okay, of course, I'm not perfect. It doesn't happen all the time. But generally that happens. And when I wake up, I do a few things every morning. I do a practice of mindfulness, which at the moment is this kind of meditation breathwork piece that I'm doing uh, for about 10 minutes. Then I come into my kitchen and I make myself coffee, right? So I, I weigh out the coffee, I pour the water in, and I put my timer on for five minutes, right? In those five minutes, I'm still in my pajamas, right? In those five minutes... Um, I don't go on Instagram. I don't go on email. I I don't look at the news. 
I do a workout in my pajamas. It might be body weight in the kitchen. It might be a kettlebell that I've got in the kitchen. Whatever. It's only five minutes. And at the end of those five minutes, the timer goes off and my coffee's ready. And then I sit down and I do the, I call this the three M's of a morning routine. The first M, mindfulness. The second M is movement. And the third M is mindset. And then I sit there with a cup of coffee and, you know, I'll read like a chapter of an uplifting book. You know, it's how I start pretty much every morning. Now, why I bring that up is that doesn't cost me any money, right? But that middle piece, a lot of people struggle to move regularly. I don't go to the gym, but I do a five-minute strength workout every day, and I probably haven't missed a day in maybe three years or so. That is not because I'm more motivated than anyone else. It's because I understand the rules of human behavior. And, you know, my, my two books ago, uh, I wrote a book on on habit change and behavior change. And there are kind of six rules I put in that. But the top two are things that really help put this into perspective for people. Number one, you've got to make it easy. Number two, stick it on to an existing habit. This is why I never miss a workout because five minutes, I can never say I don't have time, right? I can never say, ah, oh, you don't have time. I've always got five minutes. And secondly, I stick it onto a behavior that I am automatically doing, which is making my coffee. Like I don't need a reminder to make coffee. I don't need my PA to phone me at 5.30, say, wrong and don't forget today, you must make your black coffee. No, I'm doing that automatically. So I stick on that new behavior there. So that doesn't cost any money, but so I'm not have to put skin in the game as it were in terms of paying for something. It's body weight normally, it's free, right? The kettlebell is what? 10 pounds, what, $20 or something, nothing much, right? In in terms of, certainly for me, right? I appreciate not everyone can afford that necessarily, but, you know, it's not much for me, right, to have that. And it's not that I use motivation to do it. I just use the rules of human behavior, which frankly, Amazon used to get you to buy more, Netflix used to get you to watch more. So does YouTube, right? The reason they roll one video into the next video is not out of the goodness of their own hearts, right? It's because if you make something easy, people will do it, right? That's why when Amazon moved from uh, multiple click ordering to one click ordering a few years ago, estimates say that their profits went up by $300 million a year, right? Because they made it easy. And I think that we can take those rules that uh, businesses use to get us to buy more and consume more, right? And I'm not criticizing them for doing that. They're doing what they need to do. I'm saying, when it comes to things for your health and your happiness, you can use those principles to, you know, bring those things into your life in a way that feels simple, that feels manageable, that doesn't cost a load of money. If you've got money, great. But even then, you don't need to spend a lot of money on it. You know, I don't need to spend a lot of money on my workout, but I stay in pretty good shape. And I do this five minute workout every day. So hopefully that's helpful for some of your listeners, Jesse, to really help frame things for them as to how they can actually make these things achievable in their own lives. I'm sure it is. And I want to continue the morning routine. We got to the point where you've had coffee, you've gotten your workout in. Let's let's take it from there. Are you somebody that has breakfast at that point or are you into intermittent fasting? Yeah. So I, I, I um, you know, what do I do then? So I do a practice of mindfulness, right? The first M. The second M is a practice of movement. Then the third M is mindset. So for me, I've got my coffee and I will sit there and I will have a few books kicking around. Maybe it's a podcast guest that's coming on that I need to prepare for, but something that I enjoy and that makes me feel good. I don't watch the news then, right? If I don't watch the news full stop, actually. Um, and I will read... And so I I feel good afterwards. I feel like I've had a bit of introspective time. There's a there's a thing in the um there's a chapter in the new book called Take a Daily Holiday, right? So it's one of my favorite chapters. And um I, I'll I'll answer you about what I do for my diet. Do you mind if I just quickly explain the Take a Daily Holiday? Because I think it's a really helpful perspective for people. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's not go quick though. Let's get into the nuances. Yeah, okay. So so take a daily holiday is um, this idea, I got the idea, right? One of my one of my best friends uh, told me that when he used to work in a factory, his boss would have a counter on his desk and every day they'd come in and, he, and, the, and his boss would say, only 66 days till I'm gonna be in Florida on a beach, only 65 days till I'm gonna be there 
And I thought this is really interesting. Some people are living their lives, counting down the days for that one week a year where life is good, where they can chill and relax. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. What is it about a holiday that people like? And I thought, well, of course it depends who you are and where you go. It could be the sun, it could be the beach, it could be time away from work, sure. But I think one of the big things holidays give us is perspective. They allow us to reflect on our life. Like, you know, if you ever get on a plane, you know, within 20 minutes when you're up there, you suddenly start to get this, literally this 30,000 foot view on your life. And, you know, all the little things that you're bothered about, you just go, oh, you know what, it really doesn't matter. You, you get this deep level perspective. I think that's one of the things people really love about holidays is it gives them perspective. And I contend that you don't need to wait for that one week a year in the summer to go on holiday to go on a beach, to get on a plane, right? You can take a holiday from your life every single day and you should. And what I mean by that is what practice do you do on a daily basis where you step outside your life so you can reflect on it? This could be a walk. This could be journaling. This could be meditation. This could be, you know, reading a book, anything, but something where you stop and you step outside your life. Uh, and I think it's so, so powerful. So this morning routine for me is my daily holiday, right? It allows me to get in touch with how I'm feeling. It allows me to get in touch with my innermost thoughts and emotions. And I think one of the biggest problems, and this relates to health, this relates to happiness, is that we're not in touch with how we feel anymore. That's why so many of us engage in these junk happiness habits because we're so busy consuming. We wake up and we put on the news and we go on Instagram and we're on email and we're, we're, you know, even if we're consuming good content like your podcast or my podcast, let's say, right? Even that, I would say, even as a podcast host, I'll say, you know what? Sometimes even you, you, you don't want incoming sometimes. You want to just pause and allow your thoughts and emotions to come up. It's very much like when I was a junior doctor, right, in Edinburgh. I remember being taught um, about early warning systems, right? One of the senior consultants said, guys, listen, if we track certain parameters in our patients, like heart rate, oxygen saturations, respiratory rates, we can tell in advance, like in four hours, this person is going to need a high dependency bed or an intensive care bed. So, if we track it and we know they're going on that path, we can do something to take aversive action so they don't end up there. And that's for me what a daily holiday is for us. It's our own early warning system where we start to be in touch with how we're feeling and go, ah, oh, you know what? I am feeling a bit stressed. Or for me, Jesse, right? I now realize that when I'm under a lot of pressure and I'm maybe overworking, I get this tightness in my upper right back. I probably had it for years, but I was so busy distracting myself, I didn't even know. Now, if, well, say, when I'm meditating first thing in the morning or doing breath work and I feel it, it's like, oh, okay, cool, what's going on? Oh, are you working too hard? Do you need to have an early night tonight? Do you need to say no to a few work invitations? Do you need to make sure you go for a nice walk at lunchtime? You know, it allows me to take aversive action so that I don't end up keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And so, I just wanted to frame that for people because I think I want everyone listening, Jesse, or watching to think about their own lives and go, well, how do I take a daily holiday? What is a daily holiday for me? And if you don't have one, I'd encourage you to have a think about what, what could something you do each day to give you that perspective be? And it doesn't need to be like an hour long. Even five minutes of taking a pause and reflecting can be really, really useful. So that's the context of why I think these kind of practices are so important. But to, to answer your question, the third M is mindset. As I say, I, I drink my coffee, uh, I, I'll read a book or something. And this in usual takes me about 30 minutes or so. Sometimes if I'm compressed for time, it'll be 20 minutes. Sometimes it'll be 40 minutes, let's say on a Sunday or a weekend, but usually around half an hour. Now, five years ago, it wasn't. Five years ago, it was very short. I have been building. I've not just woken up one day and suddenly I have a gorgeous morning routine. No, 
I started small. I built up over time. I've started to make shifts in my life. That's what I do with all my books. And this one, it's these small changes, right? You will not recognize where you're at in six months. In the moment, it might feel like it's small, but you keep showing up day after day and doing these things. You will find that you do actually transform the way you feel, the way you live, your happiness, your health. Um, in terms of my diet, uh, I prefer the term time restricted eating personally because. I think a lot of the time people get confused with intermittent fasting, time restricted eating. And I think these things can mean different things to different people. So I usually will eat all of my foods uh, within a 10 hour eating window, right? Um, that's what I try and do. I've realized that for me, it works really well and it works around my family life. So, um, that will typically mean I will not have breakfast until 8 a.m., okay? And I will usually have finished my dinner by 6 p.m., which means that between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m., I don't tend to consume food. It's not always, I'm not perfect. You know, it doesn't happen, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But I would say 85% of the time, that is what I do. I find it works really, really well for me. Um, and just to be clear, that I have a black coffee in the morning or two black coffees. And, and, and that is that is outside my eating window, but I don't consider that, uh, that a problem. You know, all the research seems to suggest that black coffee with no milk, no sugar, um, no cream or anything is completely fine. You know, people like, um, I know you've spoken to Jason Fung uh, on your show, um, you know, Professor Sachin Panda from the Salk Institute in San Diego, who's, who's probably the world's leading expert in time-restricted eating. Again, he says the same thing. Black coffee seems to be absolutely fine. Black tea, as long as you don't have the sugar or the cream with it. So yeah, I would say typically I try and uh, maintain a 10-hour eating window. And you mentioned being a family man there. I'm curious, what happens with two young kids when you're going through that morning routine and say they get up early and and say, dad, you know, I want to play with this or what are you doing over there? Yeah. Because, you know, I think a lot of times when people talk about these morning routines, it can come from people that don't have kids. Talk about from hey, your man, perspective how you I'm... go about handling that. Yeah, Jesse, it's a great question because sometimes you will see this on YouTube, these kind of this kind of super successful guy telling you about their productive routine and they've got like their fancy gym in their basement and stuff. And you're like, yeah, that's all great, man. But that doesn't feel relevant for like a lot of people, you know, and I'm not criticizing that at all. It's just, you know, I think, I think your question is great. So I, I, there's a couple of things to say there. The first thing is the old Rongan, Jesse, the old Rongan of five or six years ago, if I'm honest, got a bit frustrated if my kids got up and they were down and, I, and daddy's trying to meditate. In my head, I would tell myself a disempowering narrative. Man, I can't believe, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try and show it to the kids, but in my head, it's like, I can't believe they've got up. You know, man, I, I need this time to myself. It's really important I meditate. And I'd almost create a new level of stress because what? my kids have got up early and they want to come and see their dad. I mean, that's that's the reality. Why would they not want to come and see their dad if they're up? So this, there's a whole, on a, on a side note, there's a whole chapter in the book on how we can create new narratives around things and not to take disempowering narratives. And I think, honestly, that's the thing that's helped me the most in my own life is knowing that I can choose a different perspective in every single situation and that it's down to me. So how that plays out here is now I embrace it when the kids are down, right? So for many years in my, well, a few years ago, my daughter, she she has a sixth sense when daddy is up doing her morning, doing his morning routine and she, she'll she come down and come into the living room. And, you know, usually it's like I've done the first two, two pieces and it's usually when I'm uh, trying to read or something. So I would include her in it. Like, and we would do affirmations together. So we used to, when she was a bit younger, sit and hold hands and we'd say, I'm happy, I'm calm, I'm stress-free. I'm happy, I'm calm, I'm stress-free. We'd say that for about two minutes. At the end, she's got a big smile on her face. I've got a big smile on my face. We feel really positive and uplifted for the day ahead. Nowadays, kids are a bit older. If they come down and say, oh, daddy, what are you doing? I said, oh, you know, darling, I'm, I'm doing my routine at the moment. You know, this is really important to daddy. I said, okay, all right, great. So can I do it with you? I said, yeah, you know, I'm, what do you want to do? Like I'm doing the reading piece at the moment. You know, should we do something together? I go, no, no, okay, you read there. I'll just sit next to you and I'll read my book. 
I said, okay, cool, right? So I include them in it now, right? I, I welcome them in because anytime you are trying to resist the way life is, you are bringing emotional tension and stress into your body and that stress needs to be dissipated and neutralized in some way. And often we turn to these junk happiness habits later because we've created this emotional stress in our body. So I now embrace it. In fact, two weeks ago, right, I got up a bit late, I was meditating and the kids were both downstairs in the next room getting ready for school. And I remember meditating and I thought, this is awesome. This is like, you, you, you now, it's like lifting extra weight. I'm like, can you meditate with your kids now making a racket in the next room? So actually, this has been a shift in my perspective. Nothing's changed. The kids are being kids. They just want to play. They're going to do their thing. Many of us create mental turmoil inside our own brains by the narrative we put on it. Oh, I can't believe they did that. It would typical. It would only happen to me. Hey, like you can keep taking those narratives in your life, but I promise they're not helping you. They're not serving you. When you know that you can take control and you can choose what perspective you take on this situation, you will get a lightness and a freedom. And also the other thing I would say about having kids is I talk to my kids about all this stuff. In fact, I'd say, you know, my son's 11, my daughter's nine. They help me write my books. Honestly, like we talk about these ideas because I think, well, why kids kind of get all this stuff, right? Over the breakfast table, we'll say, I said, oh, you know, I'm trying to work on this. What do you think of this idea? Yeah, daddy, I like that. Have you thought about this? I'm like, oh, darling, that's a really good idea. Yeah, actually, that I'm, <laughs> I think that's, the, that's how I'm going to write about it. That sounds really, really great. And so they know, because I'm very open with them, that daddy having a bit of time to himself is really important each day. And so instead of trying to keep things separate, I've included them in and I appreciate, Jesse, they are a bit older now, 11 and 9. I know if you've got a young child, if they're one or two or three, sure, you know what? You may not be in a position where you can do that. You know what? That's the way it is, right? Try and take the health advice that you get on podcasts like, like your show, Jesse. I would say with a bit of, you know, you need a bit of nuance. Not every piece of health advice is going to work for every single person in every situation in their life. The truth is when you do have young, young children, you may be a bit more sleep deprived than you would ideally be. And then it can be really disempowering when you hear like a podcast on sleep and hear all the benefits of sleep and all the problems when you don't sleep well. I've fallen into this trap before, you know, you know, I've realized as someone with a very large audience online, I've got to be very careful when promoting the benefits of sleep. I've realized that sometimes without realizing it, you can make people feel bad who are not getting enough sleep. So I always try and caveat it now as much as I can to say, guys, look, there are going to be periods in, in your life where you can't sleep as much as you might want to. That's okay. Right, just be aware of that. So I think that that empowerment, that discernment, that idea that not everything has to be taken for us at every stage in our lives. Again, I think that's a missing piece that people need to think about a bit more. That's so important. And earlier, Rongan, you talked about how a doctor yourself ended up writing a book about happiness. I want to take things even further back and talk about how a conventionally trained doctor yourself how did you even get tuned into this other world of health and wellness? Yeah, you know, Jesse, I've always been a curious person. I've always, um, you know, I've always been fascinated to ask the question, why? So how that looks through the lens of a medical doctor is I was never satisfied just to hear what my patient's symptom was. Like, oh, doctor, you know, I've got this really bad headache, you know, you know, we're trained to to put that headache in a category. What is it? Is it a tension headache? Is it a migraine? Is it a cluster headache? What is it? Because once we put it in the right box, we can go down the treatment pathway. Oh, it's a migraine. Okay, okay. Here, here are the migraine medicines I've got for you. Oh, it's a tension headache. Okay, great. These are the tension headache medicines we have for you. That's a gross oversimplification, but it's not it's not as overly simplified as you might think. That really is how we are trained to think. What box can we put these collection of symptoms in so we can we can give some form of treatment? And that that always frustrated me. You know, one day, Jesse, um, early on in my career, I look back at my patient list for the day, and 
you know, I'd probably seen about 45 patients that day, which is a stupid amount of people to see. And I asked myself, how many patients have you really helped today? And I honestly looked at the list. I thought, well, you've only really helped 20% of people. The other 80%, you know, you've done something. You've um, given them a prescription, which you kind of knew would just be putting a sticking plaster on their symptom. You knew it wasn't getting to the root cause of the problem and that they'd be coming back. You might have sent them for a test or referred them somewhere. But, you know, for 80%, I thought, I really, I don't have a good idea of what's going on. Uh, I haven't helped my patient understand what's going on. So this is just going to keep coming back. And I just thought, I can't keep doing this for 40 years, right? I, I don't want to practice this way. I, I want to understand what's going on here. And, you know, there's I, I've, this is well documented online. You know, my son, when he was six months old, he he had a really serious incident. He, he had a convulsion. He nearly died from a preventable vitamin deficiency. Um, and really that whole situation, that whole situation changed me where uh, modern medicine saved his life for sure with you know, intravenous calcium, intravenous vitamin D. But that was it. There was nothing about, well, could the fact that he's not had vitamin D in his body for the last six months be why there's some allergies and intolerances and bad eczema? Not interested. And I, I felt so bad about what happens that I made a vow when I took my son out of hospital that day at six months old. I made a vow that I'm going to get my son back to full health as if this had never, ever happened. And that drove me, you know, I would study nutrition, I'd study the gut microbiome of three, four hours a day, I would be reading online, I'd be researching with a single quest, how can I get my son back to full health as if this had never happened. And the things that I learned, I applied with my son, he is now an 11 year old, thriving, healthy, happy, young, young, I was gonna say young man, but he's still a boy. Um, the same tools and principles I applied with myself and my family, we're feeling as well as we've ever felt. And I started applying those same principles with my patients. And I found that, wow, I'm using less medication than I've ever used before. And I'm helping people get better than they've ever felt before. And so that really is a, that's a kind of a brief summary of my story into how I got so interested in this. And the more you delve into this, the more you realize that most of the health conditions we see can be explained by the way we're living our lives right? And we are not taught that as doctors, which is why I write these books. It's why I do the podcast. It's why I, I've got a training course that, you know, we trained three, 4,000 healthcare professionals now in the UK and across the world, teaching them these principles of nutrition, sleep, movement, stress, emotional health, because actually once people understand these tools, both the medical professionals and the public, you know, we're going to start seeing big change, big transformative change. And you know, I truly believe that everybody has the ability to be the architect of their own health and happiness. And everything I do out there in the world in public really has that single goal in mind. I want to empower people so they don't have to be reliant on other people and doctors. And, you know, as much as possible, of course, there is a role for doctors with certain things. I'm not saying that. But a lot of what people go to see with doctors for, doctors are not the best trained people to actually help. That's the harsh reality. It's the uncomfortable truth that many people don't like. But the way I see the world, the way I see health, it's 100% true. And to this day, are you still working one-on-one -on -one with patients? Yeah, I am. Although I will say, Jesse, um, I, I'm considering what to do about that. Because as I say, this July, it's going to be 21 years. Uh, I have seen tens of thousands of patients in that time. Now, circling back to alignment, right? And what we've been talking about as a theme throughout this conversation. Well, how do I apply that to myself, right? Well, um, I am probably slightly overcommitted in my work at the moment. That is true, right? Yes, I'm passionate about helping people, but I feel that I've I've got too many things that I'm juggling. Yes, I'm disciplined. Yes, I'm structured. And one of the things I've been thinking about is my stated public aim is to help 100 million people over my career live healthier and happier lives. So then I think, well, how do you do that? Well, 
you know, I know I, I've had my own primetime BBC One show before, which has been shown in 70 countries around the world. So I've seen the power of media. You know, you create something really great that goes onto a big network. You know, when my I had this show in 2015 and 2017 on BBC One, which is the main channel in the UK uh, called Doctor in the House, where I would go and live alongside families who were sick for four to six weeks, right? It had never been done before. And every family I managed to get either fully reversed or, or significantly better, whether it was type 2 diabetes, panic attacks, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, irritable, you know, all kinds of different conditions. I showed on a primetime show that without using any pharmaceutical medications, just by making small changes to their lifestyle, you could get people significantly better. And that really opened up my eyes to the power of the media in terms of how you can give positive, inspiring messaging to a large volume of people. Now, I don't do that show anymore, but you know, my, my, my health podcast, Feel Better, Live More, is the most listened to health show in the UK and Europe. You know, we have millions now listening and watching every week, which is just incredible. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of work. You know, I research every single guest myself. I don't have a researcher. I don't want a researcher. I like doing the research. I like reading my guest's book, going into their story. It's how I want to experience life. You know, yes, there's a business case. You know, it's much better if someone else does it. Great. That may work for some people. But in terms of that leg alignment, that key leg of the core happiness tool, it's not how I want my experience to be. So I do my weekly podcast. I write a book a year. I see patients, I teach doctors, right? We've got this really great Royal College of GP accredited course, but that's a lot of work. I'm married, I've got two young kids. I help look after my elderly mother, right? Not everything is now fitting, something has to give. And so I've been asking myself, well, you know, this summer, 21 years of seeing patients. Let's say now I see a lot of complex patients. I've seen them for an hour, an hour and a half. People who are under specialists, under doctors and can't get better. I see them and try and put it all together for them, put all the pieces together. And I think, well, look, wrong. let's say you see eight to 10 patients in a day. Like, I know the impacts my podcasts and books are having on millions of people. I read the hundreds of DMs every single week about oh, I don't have depression anymore. I now know how to manage my anxiety. My mum's reversed her type 2 diabetes because of your last book or whatever it might be. And I think I've been really questioning, you know, Jesse, what does it mean for me to be a medical doctor in 2022? And I'm starting to come to the conclusion that actually maybe it's time to take a break from clinical practice, see how that sits with me, focus on the other things. And then, you know, why, what, what is my resistance to it? Honestly, it's probably what will people think, right? It's that inner voice of external validation. Oh, you know, are you a real doctor? And then you think, well, hold on, this is just noise in your head. What do you mean, are you a real doctor? Of course you're a real doctor, right? You teach doctors, you've got 21 years of clinical experience. And actually the original word doctor, what does it mean? It means educator, right? So arguably I'm doing more meaningful work by cutting back on something that allows me to help more people. So I haven't quite resolved this conflict in my head, Jesse, if I'm honest. But as of now, I am still seeing patients. But my strong suspicion is that at some point this year, I may take a pause, it may not be forever, just to see what does my life feel like? What does it look like when I don't see active patients. And again, I think there's a wider point there for people, which is, you know, let's say you do some of these exercises on alignment. It's not that you have to make a decision and live by it forever. Just because I made a decision at 18 to go to medical school, does that still mean at 44, I have to still do the same things that I thought I was going to do when I was 18? Well, no. You know, do you know what I mean? Many people fall into that trap. I still feel I'm being a doctor by teaching, by educating, by inspiring. And so, yeah, this is quite, I guess you can tell from the way I'm answering this question that I'm something I'm wrestling with at the moment. Um, so I hope that I hope that answer made sense though, because it, it is something I think a lot about. 
Now that makes a lot of sense. And you beat me to the punch. That's what I wanted to get to. The fact that you are doing so many different things. And again, we're talking about happiness and, and having balance. So I'm curious how you went about doing that. So happy to hear you're thinking about balance and how that, how that might look in the future. Yeah. Just can I say that on balance again, like many people think happiness is a destination that one day we're going to arrive upon and everything is going to be great. It's not, it's a skill that we can work on and develop, but balance you can think about in a similar way right? Balance is this, this mythical work-life balance. It doesn't just arrive one day and then you're good. Oh, I got it now. Man, it shifts. You may get it for a little bit of time and then something will come in and shift again. So that's why I think the skill to develop is awareness, right? Awareness, self-awareness. Know when you're out of balance. I go, oh, that's okay. Cool. I know I'm out of balance at the moment, but I know but by knowing that, you can start to take steps to get back towards that balance. But I don't think you ever get there. You get closer. You have periods where it feels good and then periods where it doesn't again. But I think that's life. You know, we're not living in a monastery where we've given up all our worldly possessions to meditate every day and find the meaning of life. You know, most of us are trying to engage with life in a different way. And so I do think also balance is something we it's a moving target. You know, the truth is, Jesse, as we are talking now, I'm in the middle of my UK book tour, right? I normally go to bed at nine. I'm still on stage at 10 p.m. at the moment. Then I do my book signing. So the last three nights, I haven't gone to bed until 1 a.m., right? But my body clock is so drilled that I'm still waking up by half five, six. So I am very sleep deprived this week. Does that mean I made the wrong decision to go on tour? No. I don't think it does, right? This is a short-term thing. I'm only doing seven dates on purpose. I don't want to do any more than that. I'm doing seven dates. This is the busy week. And yeah, I'm feeling it a little bit. My voice is a bit hoarse. It's the end of the week. I'm feeling tired. But I know in two weeks, I'm going to redress the balance. And this weekend, I'm going to take it really, really easy. I'm going to make sure that I don't... I probably won't even go for a run. I actually feel my body is... Um, I sometimes like to go for a run on a Saturday morning. I probably won't tomorrow unless I get a really good night's sleep tonight because I know probably a nice one hour walk will probably energize me more than a kind of fast tempo run. And so again, this speaks to awareness. I'm now in tune with my body and who knows what I'll do tomorrow morning when I wake up because it's Saturday tomorrow, but I'll tune in, I'll do my routine and then I'll do what feels right to me rather than follow some kind of prescriptive plan. And I think that's progression for people. I think we often need books and plans to get us started. But at some point, you don't want to be following someone else's plan. You want to be following your own. At some point, you want to learn enough about yourself to go, ah, you know what? I like that from that guy. I like that idea from that guy. I like that idea from that lady who I heard on that podcast. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, create my own cocktail. I think these things are going to work for me in the context of my life. I think that's true health empowerment when you get to that point. And that's what shows like yours, shows like mine, hopefully help people do. Give them the information, hear from lots of different experts. But I do think people then have to convert it into what's going to work for me in the context of my own life. And as we part ways here, one more thing I want to get into. As you're being so real and vulnerable, talking about, you know, career shifts and how that makes you feel as a doctor and and pushing this week and not getting enough sleep and you're being really real being really open about who Rungan really is and part of what you talk about in your book and I really love this piece is having unmasked conversations so the way you're being right now and connecting with me and and connecting with the audience it just feels really real and really brought me to that point that you illustrated in your book. So I'd love for you to talk yeah. about how somebody on their happiness journey can use that as a tool in the right place. Yeah, there's a, there's a chapter, a uh, chapter right in the book is called Have Massless Conversations. And I, I touched a little bit on it with that case study from Stuart, uh, the guy who was working so hard, but he was never seeing his friends. What was so powerful about what Stuart did when he started to see his friends, right? These were his close friends, right? And these were people who he could truly be himself with. He could take off the figurative masks and he could actually truly share 
how he was feeling without fear of judgment, without having to put something on to impress. He could just be himself. And there is such power in those conversations because as we reveal ourselves to other people, right, we actually start to reveal ourselves to ourselves as well. Often we don't know. You know, I mentioned early warning systems. I mentioned having a daily holiday. But one of the best ways to get to know yourself is to have these massless conversations. Now, if you have those people in your life, your college buddies, your good friends, what you know, whoever it might be, do you meet them enough? Do you speak to them enough? You know, so, so I, I neglected this for years as I was getting into my career. You know, my close buddies from university, you know, we'd rarely talk, rarely see them. And I, I realize now that actually, even now, an, <laughs> like a quick 10 minute phone call with one of my buddies where I could just, you know, tap into the way we were at university. Like I feel energized afterwards. You, you feel, it, it gives you a sense of control actually. Going back to the core happiness stool, there's a part of your brain that is always scanning the external world to make sure that it's safe for you. And that's why interactions with other human beings, both strangers and close people to you is so powerful because it it tells that part of your brain that we call the sociometer that, oh yeah, you know what? The world around me is safe. You know, I fit in. Okay. That's the power of these sort of conversations. Um, and, and, you know, the, the the lesson really is is and and I feel energized. This this is this is so interesting, right? You, you know this is a podcast host, Jesse, right? Um, these long form conversations they energize me. Like I can come in starting tired. Like I'm buzzing now. I know we're at the ends, but I'm buzzing. Like I'm full of life. I've got all kinds of new ideas that you you asked me some really good questions, you pointed me, and I've been thinking. And I've realized that I've been doing media at the moment. You go on onto TV and do a four-minute live TV segment where you barely get to say anything that you really want to say. It's just quick sound bites. And they can be quite draining, but these real, these really open ones where you when you can actually shine a light on parts of yourself that you may have kept hidden away, it's very, very energizing and nourishing. And, you know, there's a whole chapter on this in the book and why they're so important, what people can do to get them more in their life. But I'd really encourage people to think, you know, where can you, who are those people in your life with which you can show up and truly be yourself? Because that's where the gold lies. If you focus on those interactions rather than these low-grade social media interactions where people often are trying to impress and, you know, signal a certain idea or, you know, Again, look, there's pros and cons of social media. I'm active on social media, so I'm not going to throw it and say it's all rubbish, right? I, I I, will say, I think most people are happier when they're not on social media, in my experience. Doesn't mean there aren't benefits as well, but I think whenever we look at the benefits, we we like to ignore the cons as well. Um, but social media interaction, electronic interaction is not the same. I call it, consider it like one-dimensional interaction, whereas interacting with another human being, ideally in person, but obviously that's not always possible. It's much richer. It's a three-dimensional interaction. You see body language. You see, um, you make eye contact. You see what their face is doing. You know, all kinds of things that really nourish every part of who we are. Uh, and so this is a new thing also for me, Jesse, you know, sharing some of these things that I've had in my life, like gambling in my 20s or insecurities I've had. I've been very, very open in this book. There's no way in hell five years ago I would have shared this stuff with the world. No way. I would have been too scared of judgment. But I've learned that actually all of us have got stuff inside that we often keep locked away. And the more we open up, the more we share, the more we reveal those parts to other people and to ourselves, I think the happier, the healthier we can be, the people around us can be. And there's there's real, real freedom and vulnerability. But many of us feel too scared we're too scared to be vulnerable. And I'd encourage you, I'd encourage everyone, take one little step this week to be a little bit more vulnerable with someone and just see what happens. It is so, so freeing. Well, I thank you for being vulnerable in the book, like you mentioned, being vulnerable in our conversation. And you mentioned feeling charged up. I feel the exact same way. I love getting to converse like this. And, and I really appreciate, Rangan, just everything you came on and shared. 
I'm going to link up happy mind, happy, happy life in the show notes. Going to link up all your social media. Thank you so much for everything. Thanks, Jesse. Keep on doing the great work, buddy. You too. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation on happiness, check out this one on freeing yourself from mental pain. From the floor, the laughter that came out, I don't know how many years in time it had been since I think that was probably the most authentic, deepest laugh I've ever experienced. It's like I got the joke.